How's that? Can you hear me now? All right, I'm too afraid to put this in my pocket because it's been popping off late, so I will have to carry it with me. Let's begin again. Welcome to this holiest of holy days, and welcome to everyone who's here either in person or online. This morning we're going to read through the Gospel of John, and in John's Gospel you'll hear words like the Jews, and I just want to clarify right now that it doesn't apply <laughs> to the whole of the Jewish people but to particular individuals within the text. The first followers of Jesus were also Jews. And now, along with everyone who's leading and supporting worship this morning, I want to invite you to enter into, with us, a service of readings and reflections as we follow Jesus in his final hours and consider what he is turning towards. So let us begin by praying. Holy God, as we journey through this familiar story, would you help us to understand it in a new and a fresh way? Jesus, you have conquered tears by your crying, pain by your suffering, and death by your dying. And we are here to remember your suffering and to remember again the wonder of your compassionate love towards us. Spirit of God, would you breathe new life into these tired bones that we might be one with you in the death of Christ so that we may also be one with you in the resurrection to new life. Amen. Let us pray. We give you thanks, Creator God, for the land on which we meet. From time beyond our reckoning, the traditional custodians of this land, the Agra and the Turbul people, have lived in harmony with their environment and nurtured this land with a deep and abiding care. We give thanks for their stewardship and pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. We also give thanks for the multitudes who have recently arrived here from many different cultures and countries and who now call this place home. Help us, O oh God, to live together in fellowship, to share our stories of hope and justice and peace, and to further the work of reconciliation in this land. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. like to put in the chat box the land that you are me zooming in from today. We're going to begin with our first hymn and the first hymn that we sing today is the, the theme hymn that we've been singing every week over Lent or almost every week in some form. So would you stand with me as you are able as we sing, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. <laughs>
Friends, we light the can Christ candle today to name that despite the darkness that surrounds us, we remember the promises of God, even when it seems like all is lost. Thanks be to God. Our worship service today is a different take on the Stations of the Cross that have been over at uh, Wesley House for our service of shadows last night. Together we will journey through Jesus' final moments through the eyes of his disciple, particularly Peter. In Peter we see a little bit of all of us. He is devout and resolute, he's zealous, um, he's rash and even fearful and flawed in any of us. If any of us can locate ourselves in the crucifixion story, it's likely we can see ourselves in Peter. Today is a service of confession, of lament, and of repentance. And through Peter's own experience, we will consider our own experiences. We will look closely at the events of Good Friday and the characters who were there to help us honestly assess ourselves. As Jesus tells Peter the truth about himself, we will consider the truth about ourselves. American civil rights activist and author James Baldwin once said that not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. So let us journey together through this difficult day, trusting in God's power and willingness to bind our wandering hearts to God's own self, remembering that everything done on this day stands in full view of the empty tomb of Easter Sunday. We're now going to have our first reading. Thank you, Ian. Our first reading is about Peter resisting and then receiving the foot washing. Now, before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, you do not know now what I am doing but later you will understand. Jesus said to him, you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, one who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean, and you are clean, though not all of you, for he knew who was to betray him. For this reason he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe and had returned to the table, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. 
So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly, I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen. But it is to fulfill the scripture. The one who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I tell you this now before it occurs so that when it does occur, you may believe that I am he. Very truly, I tell you, whoever receives one whom I send, receives me. And whoever receives me, receives him who sent me. So we have heard the words of scripture. Let us now use our holy imaginations to read between the words and consider how Peter may have felt in these last moments. Hear now dramatic reading inspired by John 13 verses 1 to 20. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. It's been a big week big week. Big entry to Jerusalem, big visit to the temple. Jesus getting into a fight with the money changers, he was so heated. Big prep for Passover. It's one of the biggest days of the year. And at the same time, everything is tense, building up to something behind the cheers and whispered voices. And we gather for Passover and Jesus is on his knees with a bowl of water and a towel. He's telling me I'm not clean and need to be washed. I say, sure, okay, wash me all over, and that was, that was wrong too. Just my feet, he says, the rest of you is clean, which I just don't get. Tells us that not all of us are clean. Is that code? Have I done something wrong? Was it Andrew? Something's going on, I just can't see which way it's going to go. What does Jesus know? What's he not saying? Jesus commands us to wash one another's feet. And so our question to consider, or my question to you today, is whose feet are you being asked to wash? What are the people or the communities um, that God is calling you to serve? Consider that as we hear our next reading. Jesus foretells Peter's denials. John 13, 31 to 38. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterwards. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, You will lay down your life for me? Very truly I tell you, before the cock crows you will have denied me three times. Jesus commands his disciples that just as I have loved you, 
you should also love each other. So consider your own life. Who are the people in it that you love profoundly? And take a moment to name them before God and give thanks for them. Following that, we'll have our next reading. Peter draws his sword. Take some time now to pray. John 18, verse 1 to 11. After Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, For whom are you looking? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, For whom are you looking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he, so if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? Would you stand with me as you are able? We're going to sing, Were You There When They Crucified My Lord? The first part of this hymn will be sung by our wonderful soloist, Diane Sleeman. Stand, please stand as you are able.
please be seated. We come now to a time of prayer, of adoration and confession, so let us pray. Holy One, we are convicted of our addiction to violence. We lament the staggering statistics of partner violence. We grieve the rising to statistics in youth crime and incarceration. And yet we also confess our own complicity in the pain of our neighbours. Whether we have been complicit in the harm that has caused physical acts of violence or uttered harmful words about each other, or simply just refused to acknowledge each other's pain, we have betrayed the peace that you left us with. We have built war economies that make conflict profitable. We have created societies that justify the violence of food and housing insecurity, or racism, or discrimination, any form of marginalisation. God of grace, have mercy on us and save us from the weak resignation to these evils. We pray it in your name. Amen. Friends, hear this good news. By his stripes we are healed, we are forgiven, and we are set free. Thanks be to God. We're now going to enter a time of personal reflection as Dian sings a beautiful, um, I won't try to announce it, but a beautiful hymn. One of the lines is in inverted commas there. Through her weeping soul, compassionate and grieving, a sword is passed. So about the mother of Jesus. Thank you, dear. The next reading is read by one of our online disciples, Alison Quinn. Please take a listen. She's down in New South Wales in Parks. Jesus is arrested and Peter denies Christ. John chapter 18, verses 12 to 18. So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Anas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter 
and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing round it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Let us pray. Merciful God, we confess too often we have been inactive bystanders in the face of someone else's pain and in the face of someone else's victimisation. Would you forgive us for the times that we have chosen to play it safe? Forgive us for the times we choose self-preservation over justice. We pray it in your name. Amen. Peter denies Christ again and again. John 18, 19 to 27. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have also taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face saying, is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, if I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, you are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, the crock crowed. Our next hymn, When I Survey the the Wondrous Cross, stand as you are able as we continue to worship.
please be seated. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him in the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I'm bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone's Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but this man said, I am king of the Jews. And Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfil what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And this is what the soldiers did. Rewind to that scripture and finish the last part. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. And then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Those three words are very jarring. It is finished. It is finished. And with that, Jesus' life comes to a close. It is finished, and with that, God's message to mankind was complete. 
it is finished and the saving acts of God that began at the very beginning of creation itself, from the garden to Noah um, and his many nations to Israel and their journey to a free and promised land, to the prophets and then their declarations of salvation for anyone who thirsts. It was finished. The task at hand was completed. The message from God to humanity was finished. And the task of selecting and training ambassadors to carry on was completed. The sting of sin and death lifted. The blood had been poured, the sacrifice made, the debt paid in full. It was indeed finished. From the very beginning of creation, God's saving actions have always been chasing us, calling us, inviting us, almost wooing us. God's saving action didn't wait for us to be worthy or ready. Um, God seeks us first. God's saving action always seeks us first. And we find that in the fullness of this saving action on the cross. God died. It is finished. Jesus, who was in every way the full embodiment of God, died for you and for me. And as we look at the events that surrounded that day, you know, the day that God died, what do we see? Who are the people that are there? And what does it actually have to do with us in 2024? That's where I want to go today. For those who erected the cross on that day, it's probably a day just like any other day. Uh, there's probably a fair amount of disinterest, maybe mild curiosity to what's going on. They have a job to do and they go about fixing it. And when they're finished, they move on to the next job. And likewise, for many, today is just like another day. It's a day to work or sleep or catch up on things you don't ordinarily get to do because it's a public holiday. Are you like the workman? mildly curious. Then we have the murderer Barabbas. And for Barabbas, the cross is a reprieve from guilt, a mark of his own freedom. But it's a freedom to continue doing what he's always done. And for some, this may represent their relationship with the cross, claiming God's freely giving gifts of grace, receiving forgiveness, but not knowing the man upon the cross. Are you like Barabbas? For Caiaphas the chief of the priests appointed by the Roman authorities, the cross is this necessary sacrifice. I think he said the words, better that one man should die. And I think a bit like him, we can theologise about the cross of Jesus and um, the saving grace of humanity without ever really touching on the personal cost of following Jesus for ourselves. Are you like Caiaphas? Where are you in the story? Then we have Pilate. Pilate stays away from the crucifixion, yet he too also bears the weight of the cross. Pilate's wife warns him not to get involved, not to judge Jesus. And so Pilate tries to give the case away to Herod. And he tries to acquit Jesus and give the choice over to the crowd. In the end, what he actually does is he tries to wash his hands of the matter. But the guilt is still there. And likewise, for many today, is a reminder of their own guilt. The guilt of shared responsibility for the cross without the redemption of Sunday, the redemption of an empty tomb. Are you like Pilate, staying silent when perhaps you should speak up? For the Roman soldiers at the cross, it is a chance to profit. As they gamble for Jesus' clothes, um, their eyes are only on what they get out of this event. 
And today many are looking to see how they can profit. What's in it for them? Is it double time and a half or a day off or an extra long weekend? Or can we get more bums on seats in church and raise our church profile? Are you like the Roman soldiers seeking to profit on this holiest of days? Then we have the disciples and they scattered in fear. They have abandoned Jesus and they're hiding fearfully because they think the same fate might await them. And today there are many of Jesus' followers who hide inside churches and at times I'm one of them. Too afraid to stand boldly at the foot of the cross, too fearful to stand next to my neighbour, whose society dictates for whatever reason that they are somehow less than. Are you hiding with the disciples? Mary called Magdalene is at the foot of the cross and she knows firsthand the joy of redemption. She has experienced the grace of God firsthand, favour, forgiveness, when no one else would reach out. Mary is devoted to Jesus to the very end. Like today, some are devoted to Jesus through thick and thin. Some experience their faith as a passionate relationship through all the highs and lows of life. So how is your life like Mary Magdalene? Of the 12 disciples, only the beloved disciple in John's Gospel appears to be standing by the cross at the crucifixion. We don't know much about him. He's responsible and dutiful and trusted with responsibility for caring for Jesus' mother. And likewise today, some of us are here out of a sense of duty or responsibility that's demonstrated through loving service. So how is your life like the beloved disciple? Then we have Mary, the mother of Jesus, who went to the cross to watch her son die. Unthinkable. I'm a mother of three and I can't imagine that experience. She's the mourner. She is utterly bereft, alone and grieving, and is swallowed up by her pain. This is a woman well acquainted with suffering and yet faithfully standing by her son as he is put to death. Not really understanding God's purpose at that moment. And there are times where our discipleship calls us to stand in the face of pain and suffering. And there are those disciples who in the midst of their pain praise God and trust God's provision, living with the unanswered questions of why. He like the mother of Jesus, racked with grief, racked with pain. And of course we have Jesus. Jesus on that cross. And in that cross, human, pur- human uh, suffering meets divine purpose. And here on that cross, we discover the true extent of God's love for all of us. At our worst hour, God displays God's finest. And for Jesus, the cross marks the end of a long journey, the end of a long week, the end of his ministry on this earth, sort of. He has endured the hardships on the road, the crowds of strangers, the betrayal of friends, the mockery of a series of sham trials. He's endured being spat spat upon and beaten, whipped and mocked. And his life's work has been torn down by his enemies. His organisation has scattered and he is finally left all alone, even losing the sense of God's presence with him. In the end, he hangs there upon a cross, alone. Except we know it's not the end. It's not the end of his journey, not even close. Instead, it's more of a turning point, a transition. The cross disturbs our sense of what is normal. To the Jewish people, the name of God was so holy that you could not speak it. So you could imagine to think that the Son of God could be a person just like them, a carpenter's son. It would disturb every sense of what is normal. 
and that's fair enough. It disturbs our sense of what's normal. It's a ludicrous idea that in Jesus, who holds all authority over all things, would go to his death obediently and voluntary. It defies all sense of what is normal. And that anyone would die on behalf of another person, let alone the son of the living God, who was without sin, without fault, is completely jarring. And yet that's what we confess today. That's what we confess as Christ followers. And it would be easy for us to sit back and kind of desensitise ourselves from all that this day means, uh, from this terrible and wonderful event, believing it to be somehow in the past and somehow not real or relevant anymore. To tell ourselves that if we were there, our responses would be different. Um, we would have been the Mary Magdalene, not the pilot, or the beloved disciples, not the Roman soldiers, or the hidden disciples. But to be honest, if anything in recent months has taught me, I know that that is not the truth, at least for me. The cross of Christ is an invitation to get honest with God and honest with ourselves, knowing that the price has already been paid, it is indeed finished, that it was for love that Christ came and for love that Christ died and for love that we have this miracle of Easter to celebrate in two days' time. Right now, um, Faye's, I can't remember the name of it, but her, her decorations up on the, the dais there, there's a tomb in the middle. On Sunday, that tomb will be open. Right now, Jesus is in the tomb. But we view the cross in full um, view of the empty tomb that is to come. So let us take time this day to be real with ourselves, to ask questions of our life. Questions like, where am I in relation to the cross? Where am I really? Um, our lay preacher, Jenny Schultz, asked a great question on Palm Sunday. What does it mean to follow Jesus today for you? How would you answer that question? What does it mean for you to follow Jesus today? Why is it important? And I guess the other question is, what character um, do you relate most to in this present moment? Recognising there will be times we relate to every single character that is at the foot of the cross that fateful day. Let us pray. Eternal God, we have come together today because the truth and glory of Easter is to be found only in the cross. It is in the crucified Christ that we see you, in the one who suffers with and for your people. It's the cross that shows us that there is nothing that you will not face, will not endure at the hands of your, even your own people for love. But Jesus, is on the, Jesus on the cross reveals not only you, we also are revealed ourselves. We see Judas, for whom money was more valuable than anything else, or Caiaphas, with his impeccable political and ecclesiastical logic, that it's better for one person to die for the people. We see Pilate, the victim of circumstance, on the opposite side of the debate to Caiaphas, but playing by the same rules. Someone's head needs to roll. We see the cynical witnesses who remembered only the incriminating words and forgot the message of Christ. We see Peter with his passionate declarations and denials when it mattered the most. We see the crowd and its mindless thirst for blood, or the soldiers in their casual brutality. We even see the centurion who admired from a distance and the disciples who ran away. God of Jesus, we are all there. We are all a part of this human drama. There is a part of it in all of us which still says that the safest response to the surprising God is to kill you while we have the chance to get at you out of our lives, to make you leave us alone, to be rid of you so that we can have the security of our own personal politics or cosy religion or national interests. God of Christ, help us this Easter not to run, 
Help us to face the truth that our own sin is more complicated, more insidious, more devastating than we ever thought. And that your grace reaches out to overcome it. That in our brokenness, even our best aspirations are potentially disastrous. But that you take them, you take our every aspiration and you transform it. That you will take us and make us co-workers with you if we are willing. Help us to be willing. Amen. Just a moment, Diane's going to sing for us again. And there is an invitation for you, which you can choose whether you want to take up or not. You're invited to come forward, to kneel or sit or stand at the cross, to have your own time of reverence for the event that took place that is at the heart of our Christian faith. And today the invitation is for you to offer both your prayers of pain and your prayers of love. In Christ's death, we hold the way of love with the way of suffering. They're not separate. They're integrated. God's love stirs us to hope that there is life beyond death. And so the invitation is to come forward whenever you're ready. Um, There is some red wool in a basket near the cross to take a piece of that wool, to spend some time maybe touching the tactileness of the wool or feeling the cross however you most um, are able to enter into prayer before God. Offer your prayers of pain and of love and then hang that wool on the cross before returning to your seat. This time and space is for you and God. Thanks, Diane. I see.
Continue in prayer. Thank you, God, for the truth that we can't change what we don't acknowledge. We thank you that you give us being, that we breathe and we watch and we wait, and we lift our heads in the air that fills our lungs. to breathe in all that you call us to, your spirit that never leaves us. And as we see the chest of your son rising and falling to the last, may we continue to find hope in your promise, giving breath to those who are struggling for air and wetting the lips of those who thirst for justice. As his eyelids become heavy and close into darkness, May our eyes become opened to the many colours of your great creation. And as we remember Jesus' heartbeat slowing and the warmth leaving his body, may we feel the eternal rhythm of life pulsing around us and through us and through the whole of creation. May we release ourselves from the constraints that stop us from turning towards you and turning towards each other. And so as we watch and we wait and we remember that you, we are your people, help us also to remember that it is indeed finished and that we look at the cross in full view of the joy that death has been defeated in and through Jesus Christ. Amen. Our final hymn for this morning, O Sacred Head Sore Wounded, please stand as you are able.
friends, there is a labyrinth set up next door at Wesley House. If you don't know where it is, if you go out this way and down around the ramp, it'll take you there. I'll be waiting over there for anyone who would like to utilise it. Friends, the service is not over, so there is no benediction right now because it can't end here. It continues in our prayers for the rest of today and for tomorrow and then comes to fulfilment in a great celebration here on Easter Sunday at 9am. So let us hold silence in this space today, waiting until we're out on the steps of the church to greet each other and converse. Stay and pray for as long as you wish and leave whenever you are ready or head over to Wesley House and walk the labyrinth. Let us pray. God of the cross, we have tasted your anguish. Be with us now as we enter this time of waiting. Help us to keep watch. Help us to hold fast and keep us awake despite the darkness and sense of despair. Hold us now with a glimmer of your great light and hope. In the name of Christ, we pray, the crucified and the risen one. Amen. Please be seated for the postlude.